Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of KSP Resurgence. Today we are preparing to do an interplanetary mission to Daystar. Daystar is a big and fiery inferno of a planet. It has lots of lava lakes and also a few exotic crystals. It's super hot because it's really close to its parent star, but that probably shouldn't be dangerous. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry for the short video. I've been having a lot of busy weeks throughout time after time. And uh, I just wanted to get this video out, because by the time I'm recording this voiceover, I'm about to leave for a hiking trip. So, uh, yippee. It should get a lot more uh, quiet in the coming weeks, just so, uh, so I will, well, I'll be able to upload more. Especially since fall break and then winter break are coming up very, very soon. Anyway, uh, all the cool weather and other effects were brought to you by, uh, the numerous graphics mods I have, such as uh, Volumetric Clouds, Firefly, Firefly, the works. Especially that really nice foggy morning I we did, you saw when I launched the space plane. You know, I'm thinking about retiring fate. I know it's only been out for a few episodes, but it, it's just kind of a death trap, especially during descent. It's somewhat stable during ascent, but whenever I try re-entering, it just tends to flop out of control like crazy. Anyway, uh, this is to retrieve the crew of, uh, I think it was our mission to a uh, rack. So let's go dock with Tengasagi real quick. So, uh, once again, I have to do another rendezvous and all that other jazz. And despite being a death trap and aerodynamically unstable, I really like the way Fate turned out. It just looks like a really, really cool spaceship. I probably gotta make a really, really a much cooler one, considering I do have a lot of parts. You know, maybe I could do like a plasma power one that uses like lithium or something from like near future propulsion. I mean, like it requires a lot of electric charge, but like some of the uh, fuel cells from Sterling Systems provide said electric charge. But they use oxidizer, which is uh, deprecated by the mods I have, which is chemical technologies which uh, replaces oxidizer with a bunch of other realistic propellants like liquid oxygen. But uh, there are still some tanks that still use a uh, legacy stock fuels. So uh, I can probably make a workaround to that. It's still going to be a minor annoyance though. I really wish more mods were compatible with chemical technologies. But like most of them are. Of course, once again, I also added a few more mods to the mix, just because I, I can't stop downloading mods. I always want to have more mods. Maybe I should get a RAM upgrade, considering that maybe my next playthrough will have like a ton and tons of planets. And planet packs t are RAM hogs. They take up tons and tons of RAM. I have 32 gigabytes right now, but I might need to get 64. Besides, even my current setup, my uh, RAM's probably overflowing and resorting to using a swap file. In case you don't know, like if your RAM overflows, it uses some of your hard drive space, a little something called swap space. And uh, that's not too bad for me since I have a really quick hard drive, but RAM is like tons times faster than your hard drive. So it does create a little bit of a noticeable difference. Besides, if I do have a lot of stuff overflowing and going to swap, it's probably going to create tons of issues. Considering this game is being run together by hopes and dreams, it's a miracle that it doesn't like crash right now or something. It crashes all the time, but like not too much. It runs better than most people would think. Anyway, uh, we have rendezvous with the mothership and are preparing to dock and extract the crew and the valuable science. The sweet, sweet, juicy science. You can see uh, Alia in the distance, Sanctars terraformed the moon. In case you're wondering where all these uh, planets are from, it's from a planet pack called Celestial Harmony. I feel like it's a really good planet pack and doesn't get enough attention for like uh, how much stuff it has and how good it looks. So I decided to make a whole series revolving around it. Transfer and crew is a little bit annoying in Kerbal, just because you have to click over and over and over again. But it's actually not too bad. 
They also stopped the gravity ring just to uh, save power. I mean, there isn't much power to save, especially I don't think the gravity rings even take up any electricity. But it's just my head cannon talking. I also have to make sure everything on the engine is disabled just so I don't waste any fusion fuel. I mean, I, I could, it does have plenty of Delta V, but like, if I do need to refuel it, like, fusion fuel is really hard to come by. If it were something like, say, uh, a fission power chip, it'd be a lot easier to replenish since the uranium in my install is way easier to come by. Too easier, in fact. I mean, like, uh, helium 3s, you can just mine it with my configs, you can mine it straight from the surface. My headcanon says that the mining stations also act as rover stations for like regolith sifting. Because you can collect helium from regolith, which is like moon dust. But the deuterium is like really, really tedious to get. So uh, I just bit the bullet and just sent the supply of deuterium. I sent the tanker to the colony I have. I mean, deuterium is actually a lot cheaper than helium 3. So if I were, if I were doing this in Korea, it uh, actually won't be too bad. Helium-3 is the real kicker. It's a really expensive stuff. Anyway, uh, as, I I've, as I have previously stated, this uh, space plane is a complete death trap. And as you can tell, it does not want to fly straight for whatever reason. I do have to make a quick save just in case I spin out again, which I did. But thankfully, I was able to regain control. I just hate flying this thing. Like, why won't it fly straight? It like flies any direction but straight ahead. It wants to fly backwards for some reason. I mean, in my defense, the space shuttle has been said to fly like a brick. So mine likes to fly like a backwards brick, I guess. Oh well. It still flies though. But of course, like always, I landed the ocean. Just because I don't feel like flying back to the KSC. Now, what I hate about these ocean landings is that they always take ages to slow down. So I just cut that part out and just skip to the part where I actually recover it. But in this case, I don't skip to that part, because instead, I'm sending out Fortitude. I'm sending Fortitude back home. Because the last episode, we actually went to uh, Gaia and Poe. So Gaia and Poe are really cool just because they're really far away from the star, which is Harmonia in this planet pack, except parent star. I really like Gaia and Poe, they look really cool, but uh, they're far too far out and kind of difficult to reach. Not to mention they don't really have all the resources I'm looking for. And at least accessibly easy to get, so uh, accessibly easy, that's really grammatically correct, but oh well, I don't really care. Now, uh, the maneuvers are really kind of tricky because I'm doing like a forced encounter maneuver. Uh, I do have to do like a lot of weird stuff with inclination changes. I, I should probably cut this part out just because it's super uh, tedious and just kind of boring. Might as well just like rant about something just to make the video and commentary a lot more interesting. What should I talk about today? I don't know, my mind's going blank. Anyway, I did decide to uh, burn a little sooner just so I can actually get on a return trajectory much quicker. When it comes to like juggling multiple craft at the same time in one save file, using the alarm clock is a lot better. I mean, like back before my time, uh, people had to download mods like Kerbal Alarm Clock. But like I started playing Kerbal like right around when the final update came out, so I didn't really have to worry about that. Anyway, uh, these maneuvers are really tricky just because you have to uh, be really, really precise. And if you make one tiny little mistake, it can actually cost you the encounter. So unfortunately, uh, if I do make one mistake, I might have to turn this craft in an entirely different direction to correct it. And this craft isn't really the quickest, most agile spaceship in the world. You know, so maybe in the, in the future we'll actually have like really, really small spacecraft that can turn around really quickly and also have enough Delta V to go places. I mean, I do have Blue Shift installed, which adds a bunch of really cool warp drives, so maybe I'll make like a cool warp SSTO. Maybe I'll put a warp drive on the Destiny Shuttle. It'd be pretty cool. Anyway, I set the alarm, and uh, that is it for Fortitude. I gotta actually think about if it's Fortitude or Tenacity, because I got two 
bunch of planetary vehicles with similar names, and it's kind of hard to balance. Anyway, this is the part where I collect science from uh, my colony and my uh, space station, which I uh, st am still yet to actually bother expanding. I mean, my main uh, gripe with this is that uh, I need hydrazine to like do my repellent stuff for rendezvous, but with the conflicts I have, I my colony can't actually make hydrazine. Speaking of exotic fuels, uh, I actually picked up a liquid fluorine, which is a much better oxidizer than oxygen. Anyway, uh, locked blooper aside, here's the lander that will actually go to Vesar and land on it. I mean, despite having a low temperature tolerance, it actually can survive on Vesar. I've actually tested it. It's actually surprisingly cool on the outside. But uh, this lander has a uh, weight as like 4,000 meters per second to delta V. It uses diboring and liquid fluorine. You know, really exotic there. Uh, I gave it extra delta V just in case Daystar is a little trickier to land on. And also, I do want to do some biome hops just because I uh, really want that juicy science. By the time I actually uh, land on all the bodies in the uh, harmonious system, I'm actually going to be want to be able to go interstellar. Just because of that's kind of the next thing we have. And I do not have wormholes, so, uh, yeah, it's gonna be a little tricky. I'm not sure how much Delta V I actually need to do, go to uh, another star system in a timely manner. And of course, you turn back. Because I do not want to bother baking a colony just to refuel the darn thing. Maybe I should pack some colony equipment just while I'm there to make a colony. Anyway, there's a lander in Ovix Beauty. Really proud with how it came out. I used some procedural some procedural parts to uh, make a gold foil polygon shape. I could have like used the fuel tanks, but I decided to clip a normal fuel tank inside a structural element element, just because the procedural fuel tanks don't support like any of the exotic fuels like a uh, fluorine or diboring. So uh tell I clipped a fuel tank inside. I made sure to disable the fuel just because I wouldn't want to bother burning any, just because I'd be a humongous waste. If you're wondering where the command pod came in from uh, for the lander, it's actually from the Artemis construction kit. It's actually a pretty good mod. It doesn't have too much part bloat. Yeah, there are some parts I won't use just because uh, they uh, don't really fit the diameters. But uh, I still love the parts it does add. You know, I really do not like mods that have part bloat. Like, I mean, stuff like Blue B Blue Dog Design Bureau has really nice parts that I love to use, but I just do not use the mods just because they have too many parts. They're really supposed to be efficient with RAM, but I just do not want to have to like wait five hours to uh, search a part because uh, the more parts you have, the longer it takes for the part list to load. Not to make you makes an entire mess. I mean, I could get something like a janitor's closet to solve that problem, but uh, well, no, I, I might actually do that. But then again, part blow is still kind of a turnoff for me. Anyway, we have arrived at the uh, mothership and we're ready to dock. I I am using some of the lander's monger monger prope propellant to dock, but uh. I do have an abundance of hydrazine on this lander, so it shouldn't be a really an issue. Oh, speaking of which, I do believe some of the parts in the Artemis fuel, Artemis construction kit, are a little bugged with chemical technologies because some of the fuel tanks contain way more fuel than they're actually supposed to carry. Which is a, it's a, it's a beneficial bug, but I'm not going to abuse it just because that would be cheating. I'm not sure if it's actually like supposed to be like that, but uh, I'm not gonna take any chances. Besides, it's, even if it is intentional, it is a little cheeky. Anyway, I'm gonna send this booster back into the dirt, Sanctar. And uh, anyway, if it's the lander, docked, and ready to go. But the lander is completely useless without a crew, so might as well send them up right now. I'm not using a fate shuttle this time, just because uh, it is a death death trap. I'm using uh, I'm using a command pod instead. This one's actually from Deep Space Exploration Vehicles, which is a slightly older mod. It's not really compatible with free IVA, but it's, it still has a few parts that look pretty decent, although not really up to par with like 
restock or anything like that. It's still pretty good. At least it has really, really nice waterfall configs for some of the engines. I mean, the, most of the engines like do use fusion pellets, which are like super expensive, so I'm going to have to make them. Which it will be somewhat difficult just because fusion fuel is really hard to come by. Because I stayed several, several times in this series. I've been looking for like a 3.75 meter cockpit that actually is like a standard form factor for a long time now. And I finally found the pot I'm, wor wor I'm looking for. I mean, like, the Almathia from a uh, near future kind of fills that niche, but, like, it's kind of weird. Like, it has a mode where it's, like, 2.5 meter, but it's, like, a adapter, kind of. Well, it goes from 2.5 meter to, like, 3.75 meter, and then the, the cone, like, closes to, like, a 1.25 meter. And then it has, like, a 5 meter variant and, like, a 3.75 meter variant, but, like, the 3.75 meter part is only, like, the center. So it's, like, kind of difficult to use. You have to make, like, your own jank fairing. It's a cool part, but like just kind of jank. You know, I actually did forget to put a probe core on this uh, capsule, but that's okay because the uh, capsule actually comes with a drone core. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually come with any like SAS modules, so I have to keep SAS off, which will be uh, kind of fun for. A rendezvous, or like the opposite kind of fun. Like the fun isn't challenging, but really difficult fun. But to be honest, I kind of want, I, I want the challenge. Anyway, we have finally reached Tengasigi and are preparing to dock. And I proceed to Fat Finger and uh, warp to the other side. Wonderful. Hate when I do that. Anyway, uh, I'm just going to line up and uh, actually uh, figure it out. I'm actually wanting to do another live stream just because the next planet after Daysar I'd like to visit is Arglurka, which is a huge high seam planet with a, with a thick atmosphere. And I feel like this, I'm going to have to do a lot of engineering work to design a space plane for it. I mean, I could probably just cheese it with something, but I don't want to cheese it or anything. But I want to make a really cool space plane just for the occasion. So, uh, I, I might do another live stream. Anyway, I've, uh, loaded up the crew, and, uh, yep, no SAS. Well, that's gonna be a pain in the butt later on. So, uh, yeah, Tagasugi is ready, and that will be the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you all later. Bye!